jumping around a little bit here. Um, this lecture is going to be on sex and gender. Um, we're going to begin this lecture with our definition, our anthropological definition of gender. Gender is the way members of two sexes are perceived, evaluated, and expected to behave. Um, there's a difference in anthropology between gender and culture and then our biological definitions of the sexes, right? Um, biology and sex are one and the same, and gender and culture are one and the same. In our definitions of sex, we talk about sexual dimorphism, and your book talks about sexual dimorphism. If you were to look at like a mouse or a pigeon, would you be able to determine what sex that was just by physically identifying it? Well, we know that some creatures are less sexually dimorphic than others. Um, there are certain times of the year when a chimpanzee, a female chimpanzee and a male chimpanzee, you can physically see the difference between them during mating. You see fertility signs, visible signs. Uh, some baboons, their butts blow up real blue. Now, uh, in humans, um, do we have any signs that we're undergoing um, fertility? Uh, this is something to consider. Do our butts you know, turn blue? <laughs> Not really. Um, how do we know that a female or a male is ready to mate? Um, that's something that's discussed in the biological section of your book. But we're going to move on and talk about gender and how the ways that two sexes in our in societies are then perceived, evaluated, and expected to behave. We're moving off topic from sex and moving actually into gender. An example that we use is, um, again, looking at the group that we've talked about uh, most recently, is that the Yanomamo Indians of Venezuela, which is a horticultural society, when a man returns home from a hunting trip, the woman will hurry, will hurry and prepare a meal. Um, if she's slow, the man has the right to beat her, either with a piece of firewood or the back of his machete or the back of his axe. Um, she, he may stick her with the barbed end of his arrow in her buttocks or leg. Not that we condone this behavior uh, in this society, but um, this is the behavior that's acceptable in this society. In uh, central Malaya, uh, the Semai, which are agriculturalists, if one person in a marriage refuses the request of another, the offended party may suffer from punan, uh, which is a mixture of emotional pain and frustration. If a girl refuses the sexual request of her uh, significant other, the man's heart becomes sad, he's jilted, he loses his energy and his appetite, he sleeps maybe for days, he dreams of his lost love, he may actually injure himself. And what's interesting is that Samai are afraid of violence and a man would never strike a woman. So when he's suffering from man, he's really um, overextending the boundaries and the behavior that's acceptable in his society. And when we think about our own society, we talk about sexual access to one another, uh, female and male, um, you can reflect on some of the issues that we have in our own society of uh, those who um, have sexual access to one another. Um, in our society, no one has the right to command or the right to, enforce, to force another um, sexual access. Right? Um, there's no domination by one sex or the other, or that we hope doesn't exist, although we know it, it does occur. Um, so let's talk about gender in other societies. Um, I'm going to move on here to my notes. Uh, we see in other societies dominance between gender. Uh, in Western uh, history, males tend to dominate societies, um, dominate um, the resources, dominate the rights of sexual access, dominate the political positions. There are, however, been some exceptions. In Iroquois, Iroquois societies, women controlled the resources and also elected political leaders. The Levadu women also ruled as queens and may have exchanged cattle or led ceremonies and they controlled their own sex lives. Um, I think what I want to do now is talk about 
some of the theories as to why we see um, variation between male and female dominance. And maybe it has to do with um, some of our some of the earliest societies and hunting and gathering societies. And we wonder why women in early societies did little to no, none of the hunting. There are four theories that we're going to talk about. The first theory is the economy of effort theory. In this uh, theory, because there's a variability in the supply of game, you have to have the knowledge of devising a, a very diverse toolkit. If you're a hunt, if you're out uh, in a hunting party, and you came across a rabbit, you need to know how to make the tools to hunt that rabbit. Or if you came across an elephant, you'd have to know the diverse tools to hunt that elephant. So if you were wandering around hunting for game, there's a variety of game out there, and you have to know the, 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 the knowledge to make the tools to exploit a variety of animals because you're, you're out hunting, and whatever you come across is what you're going to hunt. Right? So there is different skills required for hunting than there are for gathering. When you gather, you simply know what is edible and what you're going to gather up. This is called the economy of theory effort. The second theory as to why women don't hunt is called the strength theory. Um, and the strength theory really um, discusses the incapability between carrying burdens and hunting. Um, we, we understand that there's some uh, physiological differences between men and women, and this falls under the strength theory. The third theory is called the expendability theory. And in this theory, since there are small sizes of semi-nomadic people wandering around foraging and hunting, populations tend to be small. In these small populations, you want to protect the one sex that is responsible for reproducing your offspring, and that's your women, right? Since men are more expendable, you want to protect the women who reproduce and thus produce the next offspring, thus the next generation of your society. So um, this is, falls under the expendability theory. The last, is, the last theory is the capability with childcare theory. And it's impossible for those who were pregnant or bearing or caring for small children to also perform the duties of hunting. Uh, we know some of the problems that may lie in the, uh, the, the, the difficulties of a pregnant woman trying to hunt uh, an animal. Um, we also know some of the issues of small children scaring game or also attracting larger predators. So these all fall under the capability with child care theory. Not that either one of the theories is more prevalent than the other. I'm just sharing with you the four different anthropological theories as to why early uh, societies, why women didn't hunt and why men were the hunters and why women were the gatherers. Though certainly when we look at the different reasons why male dominance and, and uh, female subservience originated, we can no longer say that in our society um, that we have an inequality between uh, male dominant positions and female dominant positions, although we still use terms like the glass ceiling, though we have more and more women now breaking into the glass ceiling. As a professor in New Hampshire, and this being 2013, we have a female governor, female senators, and a female uh, mayor of Nashville. So we certainly see now women in more positions of power in our own society. And if we look back at the uh, World Cup of 1999, where um, there's a famous photograph of one of the female athletes taking off her shirt and flexing her pipes, right? We now see um, uh, women as more muscular and holding uh, positions that require physical strength and prowess, right? So uh, we'll talk about this more when we talk about um, sex and sexuality in, uh, in later lectures. As we move on, in this uh, section of sex and gender, we're going to talk about human sexuality and give you some examples of uh, some of the sexual practices uh, and of different cultures. The Washoe Indians of Sierra Nevada, uh, Southern California, um, they're a fishing and communal hunting society. In this society, uh, members 
will take on a variety of levers. Um, there are no separation, there's no ceremonies that separate women during menstruation cycles. We'll talk about this in other societies. Uh, there are hunting and there are gathering ceremonies. There are female leaders. In the Cheyenne society, in uh, the Cheyenne Indians, uh, they're a society that practice, that practice chastity. Courtship will take about five years. Um, there's no contact between adolescent boys and adolescent girls. Young men will suppress their sexual desires. There's no premarital or extramarital sex. So there's a limit on sexuality in the Cheyenne um, community. The Danny of New, uh, New Guinea, there is a five-year postpartum sexual absence after the birth of a child. There's no extramarital sex. The emphasis is once there, a child is born, resources and attention must be on that child. So sex doesn't occur until after five years after the child has developed and uh, the, there's a limit to sexual sexuality in the society. In societies that have no limit to sexual access, they include the Trobrian Islanders, uh, Polynesian groups, Oceania groups, where sex ed is taught early. Uh, it's okay for experimentation at an early age. Premarital lovers are okay. In these societies, we see trial marriages. Um, when we look at home, uh, when we look at uh, human sexuality in our own society, uh, we look at also homosexuality. Um, we can discuss homosexuality and how that's changing in our own society, but let's look at some other societies first. In pre-colonial um, Sudan, the Zande, there was a shortage of marriageable women. Um, what came about because there was a shortage of marriageable women were these boy men, boy wives. Um, boys between the age of 12 to 20 would marry older men. The husbands would pay a, a bride price or bride wealth to their in-laws for the, the services. Um, because older men require or needed a wife to take care of them, uh, to take care of the responsibilities of the house, of the home, the, the household, um, men would marry boys. Um, so. Here is an example of homosexual behavior based on the lack of resources. Uh, though certainly uh, this system has, uh, this society has changed, has, has, has um, altered. Um, the Sambia of New Guinea, uh, and you'll see uh, a clip of a video at the end of this. Um, Women are desirable, but they're dangerous. Um, in order to survive having sexual encounters with women, a boy must prepare for sexual activity. And by doing so, uh, a boy will ingest every day from six to eight years the semen of older men. This is in no way an uh, erotic uh, behavior, but what this uh, performance and this ritual does is protects the boy from being polluted and going into a weakened state when they uh, in, in do engage in sexual activity. activity. Um, you'll see a clip of this ritual performed in this ethnographic video that you're gonna watch after this segment here. Um, what we do know is that older men, less than 5% of the population prefer other men homosexually. Um, so we do know that the preference is a um, relationship between a man and a woman. So in this society, homosexual behavior is a means of protecting oneself for sexual activity in the future. All right. uh, in this topic, we're talking about also gender stratification. Um, when we look at gender stratification, maybe some of the issues what we see uh, gender stratification is due to education and unemployment rates. And we'll go into greater detail about that a little later. What I do want to do now 
is when we talk about gender stratification where actual members of a society, be it female or male, are actually stratified and taken away during certain times. So I'm going to give you the example of the uh, Yoroke Indians of California. During early menstruation, women are removed from society. The common thought was that they were polluted and they have to be removed. But in actuality, this is the time of a young woman's life where they're at the height of their power. They're removed so they can undergo uh, a ritual ceremonial process. When they're removed, they're supposed to meditate. They're supposed to self-reflect. This is a time of personal growth. Uh, they're away from their mundane tasks, and this leads them to a, spir a spiritual accomplishment so that when they come back, they are now in a transitional period where they're no longer considered young girls, but they're actually now marriageable, um, sexually aware women in their society. So, again, this is the example that we'll use for this class on gender stratification and gender uh, separation. Uh, your book goes into great detail about female general mutilation as a form of gender stratification. I want you to read that um, on your own. Uh, and that is where we'll end gender sexuality.